All right, so this is gonna be a a uh, as always a bel belated update of some things I've been watching. Um, apologies if you can hear the uh, PlayStation Four in the background. I'm currently watching some stuff on HBO. Um, been watching uh, what we do in the shadows, um, and been watching The Last of Us, and I'm, I'm savoring The Last of Us because it's it means a lot to me. The the games do, and uh, the the show has really moved me more than I could have hoped. So I'm I'm glad about that. Um, I actually, for the first time in a very long time, watching something I actually cried. Um, but not necessarily because of the show, I mean because of the show, certainly, but because also of what the show reminded me of, of what the games do to me, like why I love the game so much and why it's such a wonderful blessing to be able to take, take part of a gaming universe and controlling the characters and spending so much time in, in a world that is moving. Um, so I didn't expect to to cry two days ago watching The Last of Us, but I had a wonderful hour. It felt like I had got all these endorphins released because I never cry like that. If I cry, uh, the times that I've done that recently, it's been because of painful painful reasons. And so it's nice to do so because of something that is beautiful. So that's um, well. Anyway, excuse excuse the ramble, but that's what it, <laughs> that's that's what I've been watching on on HBO and uh, Reservation Dogs on Disney Plus as well. Uh, a lot of stuff on the streaming services and um, a little bit of movie and YouTube. Been watching some Hollis Frampton films on YouTube recently. Actually quite liked uh, Tiger Bomb and uh, Autumnal Equinox. Or was it Autumn Equinox or Autumnal Equinox? Well, pr pretty uh, moving films in their own way. Um, but that's um, for another day. Today is, is um, the physical media and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. I have a lot. Uh, let me show this uh, first. Um, I, might, I might split this up into parts, we shall see. I, I do like the idea of releasing a really big uh, video, but I don't know that viewers like that as much, so I might split this up into a couple parts. I don't even know how much of this I'll, uh, how much of this stuff I'll get through, uh, but the the Laurel and Hardy collection, twenty one discs. I, I bought this two years ago. I think according to Letterbox, I st I started this in the summer or maybe maybe early fall of two thousand twenty one. As you can see, all these movies on the back. It's gonna take you a long time to go through this. Even if you watch one a day, it's gonna take you many weeks or even months. Um, and um, but I didn't do that. I, I saw I had periods where I saw a, f a bunch in a day, and then I could I, I might have left it for a few months at some point. But uh, essentially, I watched them v relatively frequently over this over the course of this these past two years. And it feels kind of weird to have this be done with now, because uh, they they've been a part of my life now for a while. When I've needed a, a laugh, or if I've needed to, just a a twenty minute short of something that is entertaining and reliable, I've turned turned to this and um, I've never seen these films before prior to um, buying the box set but I've of course been aware of their comedy for all my life they're known as the whole and the half in Sweden so that's how I knew them as a child and uh, you know I, I'm sure that when I was seven eight I was aware of them but it, it took me all this time to actually watch the films um, it's not on the on the same level as something like Buster Keaton's film Buster Keaton's films, they don't feel as um, daring and type. Well, they're not stunt movies to begin with, but they are slapstick movies, and they do do their own stunts to an extent, I suppose. But um, it's on a much uh, smaller scale, and they have their gags that they really like to hammer in, or they really like to um, use them over and over. And sometimes it really outstays its welcome, and sometimes it it comes back around. And it all of a sudden it, it works again. It's like they find something that is funny and they know it's funny. And they know that they can, through their chemistry, spend a lot of time on that m very specific piece of funny. But I, there's so much to say about the films, so I'm not going to get into the films themselves. But um, the, I, I did enjoy going through them. Serious, I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't show this because I think this Blu-ray might have been faulty. There was something wrong with the audio. At first I thought that the audio was supposed to be in noise 
noisy and kind of glitchy uh, because this had been um, described as a fairly experimental film but then they started talking and the, the soundtrack was still like that so I was very confused I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to try and get another release of that but it's an Abel Ferrara film I recently saw Pasolini on HBO as well which I really liked a lot a very unique um, film here is Happy Hour by Ryusuke Hamaguchi. He made Drive My Car, which might be a more famous film at this moment in time. Um, this is a really sprawling film told, uh, you know, over the course of, I'm not sure exactly how long, but uh, I don't think it was terribly long. It didn't feel like it, but the, the film spends quite a lot of time in like rooms for extended, I mean, for extended periods, it, uh, it definitely lingers in, in, in the scenes. Uh, there's one particular sequence that takes place over the course of maybe one hour or an hour and a half, and it lasts for about one hour. Uh, at least that's the feeling. And um, pretty impressive stuff, and all these characters coming and going and uh, living their lives and influencing each other. Uh, I did expect to be a little bit more moved by it, for some reason, but I did like it. Um, here is uh, Vive Le Moore. Um, excuse my pronunciation of that as well. Simon Lang, a Taiwanese filmmaker. This is not my favorite from, his, from him, but I did like it quite a bit. The ending was moving. Uh, it's quite quirky at times. Uh, it says, even says comic drama here. Um, I I still like Goodbye Dragon Inn the most as long as as well as the whole, but there's a bunch that I haven't seen that I'd like to uh, get to. Uh, this is uh, L.A. Place itself, the Fred Halsted, Halstead collection. This is uh, a hardcore porno, so if you don't like that, well, just know what you're in for. If you are curious, because it's not necessarily something I watch for the porno. I didn't even really know what the extent of the porno was when I was gonna when I bought this, but I understood that it was a masterpiece of early seventies kind of underground cinema, and whether or not the film had hardcore pornographic scenes, it didn't necessarily matter that much to me. But those scenes ended up being pretty important to the story, and to what's being told, um, especially in the film L.A. Place itself. And then you have a couple of other ones here, um, the Sex Garage. I didn't quite. I mean, it's 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 mostly kind of debaucherous porn, and then but then the ending is really moving, and all of a sudden, wow, uh, something came out of this beyond the pornographic scenes, and uh, so I thought, I guess that might sound like I thought the porno worked better here than here. Um, I get that some people they're not gonna be interested in something like that because of the uh, graphic content. And that's fine, but um, L.A. Place itself really had something to say about uh, about Los Angeles and about uh, you know in industrialized life and um, the city life. Uh, all right, so here's another film from uh, Hamaguchi, actually, uh, Asako One and Two. I don't know if he made this after Happy Hour. I think he did. Um, pretty sure he did. Yeah. It's not as elaborate. I mean, Happy Hour, I forgot to mention, is very long. It's about five hours long, just over five hours. And this one is a more, um, you know, moderately uh, lengthened film. <laughs> I don't think that's English, but it's two hours. Um, and uh, it's more of a, you know, this is such a sprawling story about all these characters. And this is a more intimate story about the relationship to, to, this, to this guy that Asako, or was Asako, I guess he was the um, the woman, yeah, the name of the woman, and then Baku is the one that she falls in love with, and then um, she meets somebody who looks like him, um, yeah, and, and then she, the, the original Baku kind of comes back, it's, it's, basically she's in love with this, um, this one version version of a guy who might not be the best for her, but it's two different versions of the same, or two different uh, pe people with the same appearance, but their you know personalities is the complete different, the complete opposite, and she's attracted to one of them, 
but the film is always kind of pointing her in the other direction to more to the more stable uh, life of the um, you know the sensible um, character um, probably poorly pronounced but uh, poorly explained rather <laughs> but I did like this um, uh, I love the artwork of the disc and the the cover um, the aesthetic of the film and of happy hour actually was a little bit different from what I was in my mind expecting before and not entirely in a positive sense but the films they were both great and I'm, I'm glad that I bought them um, both of those and LA Place itself um, and Viva L'Amour and a bunch of other ones I have here they were part of a big um, WOW HD order but I'm, I'm not necessarily gonna show everything in, in you know in terms of how and when I bought bought them so it's it's all random um, all about what I feel like talking about next I suppose just grabbing stuff this is Love by Carolee Mack a Hungarian filmmaker uh, 1971 very moving film it's about this this uh, this elderly woman I don't think that the actress the actress was necessarily you know an, an octogenarian or anything but she's presented as being elderly and she's you know maybe not very well and so she's basically bedbound and she has her daughter-in-law who comes to check in on her and uh, she brings her letters from um, the old woman's son who she believes is off on gra grand adventures you know making films and having all these wild um, life experiences but then it turns out that he is a product of sort of um, um, left-wing political uh, dissiden dissidency <laughs> uh, of being the, the idea of being a political dissident right and so he's been taken in um, and it's unclear how long he's gonna be be gone and you know the daughter-in-law doesn't think that the old woman can hear the truth and so she tells her these lies um, through relatively elaborate means uh, well I don't know if it's elaborate to, to write a fake letter. I guess it's relatively elaborate to write a fake letter from a person. But that's what she does and, and you know, she lies. And as this false information is presented to the old woman, she has all these images in her head and they don't last very long. They just kind of fly by and they're snapshots of, of what she believes her son's life is like according to the letters. And we don't see the images for very long. They just kind of flash by very quickly. And I guess there's a point in the, um, the speed of the images coming by. But to me, I, I can almost not see what they are as a lot of the time. And it's hard for me to digest them all. But maybe, maybe that's the point. It's, it's supposed to be just below that duration where you can digest everything. Because it only exists in her mind. And thus it's very hazy. It's, it's not clear. It's not true. Um, but that element of the story with all these images kind of flash 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 you know without sound all the time that was was a really unique way of telling a story and I, so I really did I did I, I did like that aspect about it um, ultimately it's, it's a story about love it's very simple uh, it's a you know the right title for sure and um, I I really would recommend it um, yeah uh, here is one that I'm so happy to have. Oh, the ones of you who knows what this is, and you might know how difficult the DVD is to find. Although I think it might be available on YouTube. It was available for a while, but I had already bought the DVD from a, from a seller in Taiwan, in fact. Uh, and this was adjacent to the uh, outbreak of the pandemic. And um, he wasn't able, there was some um, limitation as to what you could send and how. And so he wasn't able to send this to me, but I, I, I won this very free, very cheap on eBay. And he asked me, like, do you want the money back or do you want me to wait until it, everything is lifted? And I told him to wait and uh, I still wanted the DVD. But this was, I mean, this was in the beginning of the pandemic, so more than three years ago. And then the years passed. Uh, at this point, it's, it, it's years. And I just didn't expect to get this. But then one day in my mailbox uh, I found something and this was inside and just I'm almost mind-boggling mind-boggling how this person has remembered all this time I didn't pay much for this I paid maybe five 
pounds, euros, whatever it may have been, plus a little a little bit of shipping. And like it really wasn't ex much money. And this is this is a hard thing, a hard, a hard DVD, a hard DVD to get. And I just um, it, it it was shipped really well, and there was like a little note attached to it. I think just very very grateful about this. Uh, I've spent so much time talking about the, um, the the context now, so I I'm gonna have to be brief about the film. But it is a mammoth film. You can see the running time here. I guess it's a Dutch DVD, um, right? Isn't it? I think so. Yeah, I think the other part is. Where is it? German? Uh, no, Dutch. Um, but the DVD is English friendly. Uh, this is one of the few uh, Wang Bing films that are available, you know, with English sub subtitles on physical media. There are two other ones in the US that I really want to get, uh, Bitter Money and uh, Three Sisters, but uh, I haven't been able to do so yet. But this one, I spent like a, f a couple of nights with this. I couldn't sleep at the time. I usually take something for my sleep, but I wasn't able to get the recipe. So I just, I was just awake all night and I, I watched this. And it was such a, a unique part of my life somehow, like that moment of intensely watching a few nights in a row, like in the middle of the night. And then when the stores opened, I would go and buy breakfast, uh, really tired. <laughs> just, and and the, the, experience of, the experience of watching the film really colored this whole weird little moment in my life when I couldn't sleep. Um... But the film itself, it's, it documents the industrial downfall of Shenyang, essentially, which is like a city very, very in the northern east of, of China, kind of just above North Korea. And it shows in many different parts um, or segments the industrial uh, factories kind of falling apart, literally, and the, uh, the people around Shenyang in the Tishi district um, not being able to um, live because they're being moved around and they're being told different things and they're not being told exactly where where they can move instead and everything is just kind of crumbling in this place and these people are at the receiving end of the political decisions decision making that's being taken at the time and they don't have much to do about it so they they have to scramble to get by literally collect scrap and sit on the street and try to sell scrap to somebody who's interested, who's gonna, who's gonna sell that along to somebody who's gonna sell that along, and it's literally pennies um, for food that day, and it's just a terrible situation for these people. And it documents so many facets of this whole event um, and this place. Just a, an incredibly impressive piece of work. Some people don't like the, the handheld quality because Wang Bing, he walks, there, there's parts where he walks around with the camera, you can hear him breathing, kind of sniffling behind the camera. And that might not be somebody's idea of a great film, but I'm like, that's, that's not the important thing here. Like what he's actually documenting and the way he's put this together, man, is it, is it educational? Uh, and is it important? And is it moving? All these people's lives and fates that we get to take part of. Um, I just can't underestimate how much this moved me. And how important this feels. So I, man, if you can see this, if you have the time and the desire to see something like this, I think you would, well, I think, I, I suppose, if you're watching my videos, you are likely interested in cinema and, and I really would recommend watching it. Uh, it might be available on uh, YouTube still, or maybe someplace else if you, if you look around. Uh, here's another Simon Lang film, another one from the Wow HD order. This is Days, but it also includes uh, Afternoon and Wandering, which is a short film that he must have released just before the Blu-ray came out, because it's from 2021. Um, uh, Days is, uh, I think, Simon Lang said something about his muse, um, Li Kang Cheng, uh, prior to this film, or some years before, something like that, that he wasn't going to make any more uh, theatrical or uh, commercial films or any, you know, story based films. And then some people felt that he broke that with this, with the release of this. But the story is very, 
uh, slim to begin with. Um, but I suppose it's not experimental in the sense that some of his other ones have been recently. But I, I really haven't seen enough to really say. Um, but uh, in the afternoon they discuss a little bit uh, him and him and Li Kang Cheng. Uh, it's a it's a long discussion um, between the two of them. Although it's more of a monologue <laughs> from Tsai and Li Kang Cheng, he's sort of um, almost uh, he has the body language of somebody who's being taken hostage into a, situ a situation that he doesn't want to be in. But their relationship and their chemistry, like I didn't realize most of what they're talking about their very unique working relationship and private relationship that they they seem to have with each other uh, and I kind of wish I would have seen afternoon before days perhaps because um, maybe some things would have made a bit more sense it's hard to say but um, wandering though was a um, sort of a compilation of, so of sorts um, of his um, Walker series so he made one a film called Journey to the West, which is part of the Walker series and the only one that I've been able to see in which a monk, a Buddhist monk played by Li Kang Cheng, is walking the streets of, I want to say, I don't think it was, it might might not have been Paris, but it's some, some place in France, you know, brutally slowly. That it, it's, it's a matter of pacing and um, it's very simple, but it's very complex at the same time. But this film was only the journey to the west film was only part of a longer series of these walker walker films where he walks slowly and the wandering is a kind of compilation of that it sort of documents a i'm not sure if it's a fictional or an actual uh installation um um with a bunch of different screens of the walker films but it it shows somebody walking through the installation watching fragments of the Walker films. Um, so that's what this is. Um, I would say that Afternoon was the one that I was the, mo the most moved by, but the whole release is so great. This was released by Grasshopper, I think. Yeah, Grasshopper films. Some of these other ones. Um, yeah, this was Grasshopper too. And uh, this was something else. Well, anyway. Uh, here is a film called Revenge of the Living Dead Girls, released by Severin, a French kind of erotic uh, splatter film. Uh, really, really wild. <laughs> some of the some of the gore is pretty shocking. Like what they decided to do with the story. Well, the story in the first place doesn't really make much sense. It's very easy to uh, poke fun at the plot holes and not really quite um, understand where they were where they were coming from. I don't think it's a matter of being lost in translation. I think it's just a sloppy script, basically. But um, the the zombie stuff is so fun. It's funny at times. It's absolutely outrageous at times. Um, this was a bit of a bit of a blind buy or a lot of a blind buy, and it really delivered. Um, if you like <laughs> B zombie movies, uh, that is um, you know half entertaining, half ridiculous. I would recommend that. Here is uh, Hallelujah the Hills. This was part of a um, Revoir order and I think I unboxed this. Yeah, I did. And I talked about a few of those Revoir titles, but I didn't I didn't talk about them all. But this is a uh, Adolphus Mikas film, brother of uh, the more famous Jonas Mikas. And jo Jonas Mikas, he made diary films of his own life mo mostly. But Adolphus Mikas, he made this one film which is a bit of a uh, absurdist comedy full of non sequiturs and the kind of cartoony um, inputs here and there. And uh, then at, at, its, at its base, there's this romance plot, this um, um, triple romance. What's it, what is it, the name for it? Um, well, anyway, uh, under, underneath all of it. And uh, pretty good. Uh, I'm glad that I bought this. Uh, here's a film called Sledgehammer, a DVD from Intervision. Actually, I have two DVDs from Intervision uh, things, but more about that later. Um, this is um, this unfortunately has some filler. It's a slasher film, and a lot of it is really fun, 
but a lot of it is um, they've slowed down the footage because they didn't have enough footage basically so they've slowed it down into slow motion and a lot of the film is presented in slow motion and you have this shot of somebody slowly opening a door and it lasts for like a minute it's literally this what you can see now somebody opening a door <laughs> and it's like okay I get there's a little bit of suspense here but that is just outrageous the amount of time they spend with some scenes so that part is a little bit unfortunate but it's also kind of charming um, but the film is fun and the the DVD is pretty good uh, things is by um, I, I suppose no Barry J Gillis did not direct this Andrew Jordan did but Barry, Barry J Gillis is in the film and he made another film called Wicked World which I saw a couple of years ago, which I think is much more fun than this one, to be perfectly honest. Well, actually, this one is equally fun, but Wicked World is more uh, baffling and more actually quite emotional at times, which is very odd. It's a very odd emotion that he um, manages to awake within me with Wicked World. Uh, but this one was mostly just um, over the top, very, very low budget very incompetent filmmaking um, very very fun underground kind of outsider uh, horror but uh, it is absolutely insane it's very hard to describe but i think maybe somebody out there has seen it and you might know what i'm talking about um here is a couple of actually a few films by hong sang so so uh, Hotel by the River actually this one came out first this was the first one that I saw and it remains my favorite out of these the power of Kangwon province oh man I love the cinematography in this the ending is so achingly beautiful just absolutely gorgeous uh, Hotel by the River um, it, this is one of those films it might help having seen all of his films to kind of get some of the themes he's using over and over and to, to make sense of them better than I can but um, still good I'll be brief here um, on the beach at night alone this one I, I had to watch a second time uh, but I think I understood it and I think I really like it yeah some really uh, some, the some of the way in which he uses his camera he points his camera at something it just evokes I don't know there's no no words for it really but some of some of his cinematography is uh, uh, it's so instinctively beautiful somehow um, in front of in front of your face kind of like a chamber drama of sorts almost ethereal kind of dreamlike and very slow paced just a few scenes but they last for quite a long time it is 85 minutes so it is a relatively short film but it's still pretty standard but the film it feels like I mean based on if you saw if you if I gave you a, like a description of what happens so this, she goes here and then she talks to him and then she goes back home and so what? That that's like the first act, right? But it, it but it is the whole film because it's so slow paced. Um, but it really works and it it doesn't feel like eighty five minutes. It flies by and because the main character is so convincing, and I'm so interested in what she has to say, that it really worked very well. I do have one more. Um, virgin stripped bear of her bachelors i think it's called but i haven't seen that yet um that's the last one from the wow hd order that i haven't seen yet um here is uh kylie kylie blues by b gan a uh, chinese filmmaker from mainland china um this is uh kind of like a diptych of sorts and it's almost a little bit aesthetically bipolar because um the see the things you see well i suppose this this might be from the first part but in the second well I, i'm not gonna get into it but the second part is basically one long interrupted shot which um it, it it's really cool because you kind of get a sense of you know very similitude i guess might be a word you can apply to to the feeling you get uh, when the shot is uninterrupted but just a sense of place right the camera is moving around and it's, it doesn't cut. The, the characters follow along with the camera for a very, very long time. You get this sense of place in a way that at times is absolutely wild. 
and at times it doesn't work because there are faults, there are cracks in the armor, there's um, things that don't quite uh, work because it's a long shot and it's difficult to chore uh, chore choreograph or orchestrate everything. Uh, so there's a couple of unfortunate misses and stuff like that, but um, but I, I also think that it's it's a bit a, a bit of a, a bit of a jarring transition from the first half, which is very delicate in the way the camera camera moves, into the second half, which is very sloppy because it has to be you, you know the cameraman has to run around, the cameraman has to quickly take corners and walk to the next character and stuff like that, might you know stumble here and there, so. It, it's hard to say if the, if the film works on that level, but it's so impressive on just so, so many individual different levels when, when it comes to the cinematography especially. The story leaves a little bit to be desired because I'm not sure exactly what's happening, to be perfectly honest, like what does this mean exactly? I don't really know, but the cinematography I mean, watch it, watch it for that. If you ha if you li if you like stuff like that that I try to explain now, I think you're not gonna be disappointed. Uh, it's a pretty wild wild ride. Okay, here's a film called Leviathan, which takes place aboard a um, fishing boat. I think um, somewhere nor north of of you know the U.S. I mean in the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. Uh, I think I looked it up. I don't know if it says here. Okay, the treacherous waves off the New England coast. New England, I think that's pretty, I'm not completely sure, but I think that's very high northeast. Uh, anyway, um, they use GoPros in this and you know they submerge GoPros in like fish water and you get this kind of clucking sound that you might get from a, a GoPro in a way that might take you out of the film as such but but the the it doesn't matter because the style is so different and the the camera just kind of swirls and it films the boat from all different sides it plummets into the water with the fish and with the birds and at some point you don't know what's up and what's down because the camera is upside down and the birds are here and the fish are here it kind of goes in and out of the waves and some really really cool camera movements uh, I've been wanting to see this for a long time and I'm so happy that I finally got to see it. It's a pretty um, incredible um, experimental documentary. Uh, here is John Dillman. Finally I get to watch this. Uh, this for me was on par with um, News, from, News From Home by Chantal Ackerman. Um, so I got into her work. I, I, this is a very famous film I'm, I'm, it's, and I'd, I don't really know how to talk about it, talk about it either. But I, uh, some people are gonna hate this, but I, I just uh, so uh, so moved by it and so mesmerized by the very precise action that her life consists of, or her mundane her her mundane action, if that's not a too much of a, an oxymoron. But um, I, I I got into Chantal Ackerman's work more seriously in 2021. Or period, I suppose. I don't think I saw anything prior to 2021, and I had been wanting to see them for such a long time. And this is the one that I knew about since many years back, because it is a very famous film, and I can only say that it lived up to um, my um, my expectations. What's interesting is that um, I don't think she describes her films as feminist as such herself. I mean, other people might apply that stamp to it, but I don't think she liked that stamp, which is interesting. And as such, the some of the the scenes, they have a different meaning when you kind of hear her talk about it. Um, her, her inspirations for the film versus other people's interpretations of the film and so on. Um, because I think there were a few points that I didn't really quite understand until I heard her talk about them and so that can be sometimes that that's not necessary like a, a, a filmmaker's film or what whatever their intention was doesn't have to be important if your experience with it is of value but sometimes it might help for me anyway to look into some of those things like what did she mean by this 
And uh, anyway, now I, I don't know how, how much of Ackermann's work I have left to explore, uh, you know, in terms of what's uh, easily available. But uh, safe to say that this one and News From Home and Portrait of a Young Portrait of a young girl in the 60s in Brussels or something like that. It's a very long title. Those three for me is like I, I just he, She's easily in my top whatever favorite directors. I don't know what but 20 maybe um, I've been so fortunate to explore her work over the past couple of years and um, news from um, uh, home movie is another one that I was moved by um, and you know um, South very very good and uh, from the east or to what's it called from the east or to the east shit well anyway <laughs> that one was a mammoth film yeah anyway let's uh, I, I, I don't really have much you know what I'm gonna take a break but thank you so much for watching this was most of the Blu-rays. I have a lot of DVDs left. But thank you so much for watching. Um, and I, I guess I'll see you in the next one.